Hello and welcome to another Royal Reviewer Transmission and today is quite a special day because we have the official, four of the official coronation photographs uh, taken by Hugo Bernard to talk about and discuss and dissect today. Now of course these are only four, there will be others. I imagine there will be different groupings and configurations that will be released over the coming days and weeks. Um, so I'm intrigued to see the full collection. I imagine we will get some with the page boys and all that kind of thing. And also perhaps um, the Wales children as well. But at the moment, what we're looking at is a group photograph, a photograph of the king and the queen and individual photographs of the king and the queen. So I think the first photograph that was released was actually of His Majesty the King with the orb and the scepter. Now, there is always one sort of portrait photograph that looks really incredibly regal. Um, we did have a similar shot taken, I think it was by Cecil Beaton of the late Queen's coronation, but she's kind of sat in the opposite direction. She's got that painted backdrop of the abbey behind her and she's kind of sat that way with the orb and the scepter what we're seeing is a little bit like what they do with the coins the portraits on on the coins we're seeing a reverse um with a different with a different sovereign so charles uh, the king is facing the opposite direction in this portrait it does look very very regal we've had a little bit of a quick outfit change He's changed into a purple tunic with some gold embroidered stripes on it. Um, and it is typical for this to happen. I think some people were wondering why the kind of change. Um, George VI also wore the same kind of tunic. I don't even know if it is the same tunic. It could possibly be. Uh, we know that the king has recycled, uh, for example, George VI robes so i'm just bringing up this particular photo now it does look incredibly regal i love the backdrop obviously taken um what's believed to be the throne room of buckingham palace we've got that deep kind of crimson red uh kind of vanishing into the shadows uh of the one corner we've got the throne chair um i like the way the robes are displayed the one thing that I'm going to have to insist on, and I haven't changed my position on this at all, I don't like the trousers. Um, I think with with the regal get-up and the tunic and the uh, the cape and and the crown, I just don't think military-type trousers, ceremonial trousers, go with the look. And also those kind of uh, ballet slippers as well, those shoes that he's got on. I love the shoes, I, I like the tunic, I like the cape, obviously I like the jewels and the crown. I just, for me, those trousers just take me out of the moment completely. It looks like party on the top um, and sort of business on the bottom and I'm not liking it. But it does look very regal and I like the composition of, of the portrait. Will we see others? Perhaps, like I say, this will be a series it's taken on the angle uh, which is more aesthetically pleasing we may see some some face on some head-on shots not entirely uh, sure but anyway i do like it and um it just does look very very regal um i'm going to talk uh, now about the photograph of her majesty the queen which we can now call her her majesty the queen um I like this photo. Out of all the photos that have been released thus far, I think this has to be my favourite. I love the composition. I like the fact that he is obviously, uh, Hugo is positioned lower than the Queen. So we've got a slight up angle. So we can see the kind of towering walls in the background from the palace. Um, and we've got, of course, the robe splayed out, cascading around her uh, we can see the details if you zoom in on the dress of course of, of her dogs her jack russell's blue bell and beth um and i love i just love it i just really think it's it's gorgeous 
Uh, the Queen hasn't really, I suppose, changed outfit. Um, but I just love it. Now, there was a little bit of controversy about what's in the background of this picture. And um, I think it was Dr. Shola who commented, perhaps saying that the statues behind her were Blackamoor statues. And of course, they are not. She, she did have to apologise for that. Well, it was a kind of half-hearted apology. But anyway, um, at least she did correct herself. Uh, she said that they were Blackamoor. They are not of Blackamoor origin. Um, they are actually weeping ladies, I do believe, in bronze. So there is no controversy in this picture behind, behind Her Majesty the Queen. So I just thought I'd point that out. The crown, I think, I've always liked the alterations to Queen Mary's crown. I like the fact that the couple of arches were removed. I know some, comment, some commentators have said that perhaps it looks a little bit too, you've got too much of the velvet cap on display. I disagree. I quite like it. I really do. I think the alterations have been a success. The removal of the Koenor diamond is not a loss to me whatsoever. Um, I actually prefer the Cullinan set, the Cullinan diamonds set into it. I think it really works. Uh, I do hope that they are returned back to um, the jewels being worn by the crown in terms of brooches. Granny's chips need reuniting. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I like the picture, so I think that's a really good one. Um, and obviously, good call to wear the coronation necklace. She wasn't wearing the coronation earrings. Uh, which again were a little bit more dangly, so so we haven't seen that. But anyway, um, she still looked absolutely gorgeous and regal. Now, uh, I'm bringing up the picture of the king and the queen. So I, again, this one, he's kind of positioned lower, so it's almost like you've got a slight angle looking up. I'm really pleased that they didn't have anything up their noses or anything of that nature. Now, in this photograph, that this is where I think the tunic with the trousers and the shoes is most obvious that for me it's a mismatch. Um, now you do have, there's been an, an attempt to make it all fit because you've got the gold stripe in the trouser echoed with the gold stripes on the tunic. So there is an element of trying to make it work. I just don't think it does. I'll pop some pictures up of uh, previous monarchs who have wore sort of that tunic or a slightly different outfit. Um, actually, George V, I do believe, also had a version where he wore some sort of higher up leather boots uh, and with some white trousers. And I think that worked as well. So is it the colour of the trousers that doesn't work? Is it just the fact it's trousers? I still, I'm pro breeches. I really am. I'm pro tights and I'm pro breeches. In any other circumstance, absolutely not. But in terms of a coronation, I do think that they would have been, they would have looked a little bit more in keeping and in place. So that's my only criticism for Charles's whole get up for it. The whole thing is just those trousers. I just wish he had worn breeches and tights, but he didn't. So I need to get over it. I need to build a bridge and I need to move on. <laughs> it's the same with the tiaras. I need to just get over it. I need to, I need to be more zen. Maybe I need to call Megan on my phone and get some yoga tips. I don't know, but I need, I need to build a bridge and get over it, quite honestly. Right, that brings me to the group photograph. Now this photograph, I think has probably um, caused the most conversation because what we are seeing is the slimmed down monarchy. This slimmed down monarchy, which people have been talking about for years, has happened. And it's not happened by design. Um, I think it's actually happened by pure coincidence. We have had what I'm going to call natural wastage. We have had obviously the departure of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex from frontline royal duties. They're no longer there. We have lost, obviously, Her Majesty the Queen, Elizabeth II, and, of course, her consort, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, for obvious reasons. 
and we also have lost effectively because he was fired almost if you like at uh, prince andrew and obviously some of the late queen's cousins are no longer performing uh, full-time royal duties so what we see before us in this photograph is the slimmed down working royals um, if i go through them uh, from the left of the photograph all the way through to the right uh, you get more of a sense so we have the duke of kent uh, we don't have the duchess of kent uh, next to him we have the duchess of gloucester next to the duke of gloucester who do still perform full-time royal duties they don't get as much coverage i have tried to cover them in the past uh with in particular a video i made on the unsung royals uh who supported her late majesty now supporting his majesty the king right next to the king we have of course princess anne in ceremonial uh, dress of course she was very happy to not have to have faffed i think <laughs> over what sort of dress to wear she, i think she was quite happy to wear ceremonial uniform next to her uh, is of course her husband sir timothy lawrence who is always there to support now he is is not a full-time working royal so i am a little surprised as to why he is there but he's always supporting princess anne the princess royal so you know to have him by by her side i think is always a constant also i think if if he wasn't in the picture we would lose a little bit of height balance in the composition because of course we have the taller william next to the queen consort and the shorter princess anne next to the king so it does kind of balance out in terms of levels and composition and i think without him the monarchy would have looked even slimmer which i'm not a big fan of anyway then we have the king who coincidentally is positioned pretty much center in the composition there has been some talk i'll stop and talk about it now um, before i get to the others that perhaps the whole configuration looks a little bit off center it looks like uh, the king is not center in the composition he is center in the composition it just looks a little bit off because what you're seeing is charles and camilla the king and queen as almost one unit because they are the ones wearing the crown so your eyes are immediately drawn they are wearing the robes that are cascading down the steps uh, they are wearing pretty you know almost block white apart from uh, charles's black trousers and purple tunic so your eyes are immediately drawn to them and as a unit they do look off center but the king is pretty much dead center not exactly there is a little tiny if you look in the center of of the swag above them and you draw a line down the center is actually the king's shoulder so he could have come over a little bit more towards princess anne's side but then that would have shunted everyone across anyway he's almost center not quite but as a unit they do look a little bit off a little bit off center uh the only way around that that i can think of is that if you actually move them and put, put them as a as a two as a twosome in the middle it would have meant that princess anne would have stood where sir timothy lawrence is standing and it would have pushed everyone down a step which means that the only place for the duke of kent would have moved next to prince edward on the other side um which would have balanced things out but then we would have had a difference of the height we'd have had a difference in height between william and anne and that may have sent the the eye looking at different any anyway we've got what we've got this is the composition i imagine there may have been other compositions um photographed which we will see in the coming days and weeks but this is the one that we've got for now to to, to talk about uh, i also think obviously uh, a point of princess anne being next to the king i spoke about this before about how highly the king regards his sister and if he didn't realize her worth to the late queen and the monarchy in general i think he certainly does 
now. Uh, she is invaluable to the monarchy, and it will be a sad day whenever she has to retire or passes. So he, she is incredibly valuable. She is, it's an example of if you are a spare, and of course, Princess Anne is not really the spare. It was always um, the Duke of York that was the spare uh, in terms of Charles. But it just goes to show how someone lower down in the sibling sort of line of succession, if you like, can have a prominent, meaningful, successful life of service that is well re rewarded all the way through your life. And of course, that is what Princess Anne shows compared to the likes of certain people who have left the uh, working royals. Uh, Princess Anne, just through getting on with sheer dedication, service, commitment to country, again, echoing uh, the king's values of being here to serve, not to be served, Princess Anne is in a prominent position all the way through her life. So if Prince Harry had any doubts in his mind about what being a spare actually means, he need only look no further than his aunt, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, to see actually what a meaningful role being a supporter to the crown can actually bring. And it doesn't mean less respect. It actually means more respect. People really respect Princess Anne, and so does the king. Moving on, next to the king, obviously, we have the queen in her rightful spot. I love the way that the cloaks, uh, the robes have been cascaded down the, um, down the steps. I love those. Next to the queen, we have, da, 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 we have Prince William, the Prince of Wales. Again, a little bit of conversation here because, of course, he's standing next to Camilla, the queen, who is his father's um, you know, second wife. And of course, there was the whole love sort of triangle bit and other woman uh, between Diana, Charles, and, and of course, Camilla. So what we're seeing, I think, is full acceptance. What I think we are seeing is a really grown up and mature Prince of Wales. Um, he knows that you know, personal feelings aside, and of course we don't know fully what his personal feelings are. We know, we, well, we think we know what Harry's are, partially, because of spare. Uh, but William is, in, at least in public, being very supportive of, of his father, his father's role, new role, and that of Charles's biggest support. And that is, of course, his wife, the Queen. Camilla. But so there we have the Waleses on Camilla's side. Um, you know, you could have swapped them over, you could have you could have had uh William on the king's side, but again, I think it's a sort of I don't know, they've gone for this, that's what they've gone for. It could have been set up differently, we could have had the Waleses on the other side, but we haven't. William, of course, in his garter robes looking rather handsome and dashing, I have to say. Uh, next, a step down, we have Catherine, the Princess of Wales, and we are seeing on the royal ladies um, the royal family order. It's the, the royal family order of the late queen, so we don't have the new king's royal family order debuted yet. It could be debuted at a state banquet. We don't know. I imagine it will be. I imagine the next state banquet will probably see it. Um, now, again, lots of talk and speculation online about did the Princess of Wales change her outfit? And I'm going to have to say and show some photographs that I don't think she did. I think it's the same outfit. The embroidery looks exactly the same at the bottom of the gown. Uh, the only difference is the top. And you can see quite clearly in this photograph, it goes into a V shape. Uh, and of course, we have the sash. What I think happened is that where under her heavy robes uh, of the Royal Victorian Order that she wore to the service, I think she had a little 
what's it known as? Not, not, it's not a full cape. It's a bit like a, a capelet or a caplet that kind of just goes up from here and goes around and around the shoulders. There's evidence of that in a photograph taken at the service. So I think she was wearing a capelet over this dress for the service. She must have felt it looked better with a higher up neckline, uh, almost like a modesty panel, uh, rather than the V. So obviously she knew she was going to have the photographs taken in which the, the capelet comes off and then you, you reveal the uh, V-shaped neckline, which looks really, really lovely. And of course, the V is to show off the beautiful and gorgeous uh, diamond festoon necklace. It really is gorgeous. So there are three sort of rows of, of rather large scale diamonds. We are seeing um, a large scale piece here on Catherine, again, indicating her position and status as Princess of Wales. And I'm sure we will see in the coming years more prominent pieces of jewellery being worn. I always said back when uh, she was the Duchess of Cambridge that her royal life is in sort of three stages. Duchess of Cambridge, Princess of Wales, Queen, um, Queen Consort. That, you know, she has, she has quite clear progression. And I think she's worn more simpler pieces apart from the Cambridge, Cambridge Lover's Knot Tiara, which I would say is quite a big piece. Um, she's worn fairly simple pieces. I mean, we've seen some larger scale pieces from the late Queen's collection. But I think now as Princess of Wales, she will be able to wear more of the bigger pieces more often. Then, of course, as Queen, uh, William's consort, she will have access to everything, whatever she wants to wear. But I think she looks really gorgeous in the sash, the Royal Victorian Order, um, the Royal Family Order, and this beautiful, gorgeous necklace. So she didn't get to wear a tiara, but she did get to wear uh, a beautiful necklace. Next to Catherine, we have, of course, the Duchess of Edinburgh. Uh, again, looking really gorgeous. I do love her outfit. And we, I think she might even be wearing uh, it's either embroidery or a bit of a capelet. I think it's embroidery, to be honest. In between, uh, let's just go to Edward at the end. So he, he's obviously wearing his garter robes. You can't see terribly too much of what he's wearing underneath. Sandwiched in between, uh, we have Princess Alexandra. Now, she is obviously being supported by the Duchess of Edinburgh and Edward. And this image actually made me go, oh because I recognize the scene and many millions of people um, around the world will recognize this, an elderly relative of the family, maybe not too good on their feet, mobility issues. And obviously you want them to be included in family photographs, family events, and you help them and you support them. And you can clearly see the support being given to Princess Alexandra from the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh. You know, you can see that those arms sort of linked and really holding her up. Um, but she's really incredibly happy to be there. And I think it's right because she, I think, has only done sort of one engagement up during this year. But you can obviously tell that through perhaps poor health, that's the reason why. But she is still classed as a working royal. And that is why she is included in this photograph. Um, so I think it's really lovely to see her there. She's not wearing um, her royal family order. I do believe she has one, um, but she's not wearing it for that occasion. So it was quite a nice heartwarming scene, I feel. Um, to see her there. And like I say, I recognise that because it plays out in families all across the land, the Commonwealth, everywhere. So I thought that was lovely. Now, I can't wait to see other photographs from, from this sort of series. Uh, I'm sure we will be delighted, like I said, for months to come with the different photographs. Um, so please let me know in the comment section below what you think about these photographs. Okay, next I want to talk about something that I mentioned a few videos ago and it caused a little bit of controversy between you lovies out there because I got quite a few comments. It's, it was regarding 
um, the fact that Harry and Meghan had the Kingdom Choir at their wedding. And I said that perhaps um, the, the King saw the Gospel Choir and how it worked um, at their wedding and then wanted something similar for the coronation. And people were very quick uh, to, come, to come and say that actually it was Charles himself that booked the Kingdom Choir for Harry and Meghan's wedding. So, of course, that was not my understanding. So I went and did a little bit of research and I found a bit of discrepancy. So there was an article where uh, a member of the Kingdom Choir gave an interview and said that, Ke that, Kensington, that, that there was a relationship between the King and the Kingdom Choir through mutual, um, mutual people, that the, the King was aware of the Kingdom Choir I think it may have even been through the Prince's Trust. I forget the detail. But anyway, there was a connection that, that, that the, the King, as Prince of Wales, knew of the Kingdom Choir um, and, that, and that he had booked them. So this is where the confusion comes in, because in the same article, it says that they received a call from Kensington Palace to book them. Now, anyone in the know will know, of course, that Charles's household as Prince of Wales was Clarence House. So if it was Charles booking the Kingdom Choir on behalf of Harry and Meghan, it would have come, the call would have come from Clarence House, not Kensington Palace. So that tells me a tale, and it tells me something a little bit different to perhaps what the common perception is. I actually think what happened is it's true. Charles knew the Kingdom Choir uh, through associations, um, and he probably recommended them to Harry and Meghan. I imagine Harry and Meghan, pretty, you know, they had what they what they wanted at their wedding. It was a kind of blend, wasn't it, between between different styles uh, and cultures. Um, so I think Harry and Meghan must have been sounding out about wanting a gospel choir uh, to have some gospel music and some soul sort of injected. And I think Charles piped up and said, "I know of." an amazing choir, I'll give you the details. And that is why the call came from Kensington Palace, because it was Harry and Meghan that booked them. It was Harry and Meghan that must have looked them up and decided they were what they wanted. But I think the recommendation came from Charles. So I'm hoping that I've cleared up that little story, because it was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a hole to kind of try and dig through and, and find out what happened. But yes, I, I think that that is the most logical explanation for that. Right, next, um, Harry's biographer, J.R. Moringer, I hope I've said his name correctly, did an interview with, I believe, The New Yorker. You can read the full thing. It's, all, it's talking mainly about what it's like to be a ghostwriter. Uh, but he did divulge with some information about working with Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Uh, he says, I was exasperated with Prince Harry. My head was pounding. My jaw was clenched and I was starting to raise my voice. And yet some part of me was still able to step outside the situation and think, this is so weird. I'm shouting at Prince Harry. Then as Harry started going back at me, his cheeks flushed and his eyes narrowed. A more pressing thought occurred. Whoa, it could end right here. This was the summer of 2020, 2022. For two years, I'd been the ghostwriter on Harry's memoir, Spare. So we know that it was in the works for two years. And now, reviewing his latest edits, uh, in a middle-of-the-night Zoom session, we've come to a difficult passage. Harry, at the close of gruelling military exercises in rural England, gets captured by pretend terrorists. It's a simulation, but the tortures inflicted upon Harry are very real. He's hooded, dragged to an underground bunker, beaten, frozen, starved, stripped, forced into excruciating stress positions by captors wearing black balaclavas. The idea is to find out if Harry has the toughness to survive an actual capture on the battlefield. So it's military training. Uh, two of his fellow soldiers don't they crack. At least Harry's captors throw him against a wall, choke him and scream insults into his face, culminating in a vile dig at Princess Diana. So we've sort of spoke about that before from extracts from Spare. Uh, so even fake 
terrorists engrossed in their parts, even the hardcore British soldiers observing from a remote location seem to recognise that as an inviolate rule has been broken. Clawing that specific wound, the memory of Harry's dead mother is out of bounds. When the simulation is over, one of the participants extends an apology. Harry always wanted to end this scene with a thing he said to his captors, a comeback that struck me as unnecessary and somewhat inane. Good for Harry that he had the nerve, but ending with what he said would dilute the scene's meaning that even at the most bizarre and peripheral moments of his life, his central tragedy intrudes. For months, I'd been crossing out the comeback, and for months, Harry had been pleading for it to go back in. Now he wasn't pleading, he was insisting, and it was 2am, and I was starting to lose it. I said, dude, we've been over this. Why was this line so important? Why couldn't he accept my advice? We were leaving out a thousand other things. Uh, that's half the art of memoir, leaving stuff out. So what made this different? Please, I said, trust me, trust the book. Although this wasn't the first time that Harry and I had argued, it felt different. It felt as if I, we were hurtling towards some kind of decisive rupture, in part because Harry was no longer saying anything. He was just glaring into the camera. Finally, he exhaled and calmly explained that all his life people had belittled his intellectual capabilities. And this flash of cleverness proved that even after being kicked and punched and deprived of sleep and food, he had his wits about him. So he's really trying to prove this something, isn't he? Everything that people say in the media really gets to Harry. And, you know, he's clung on to one moment where he had a witty comeback uh, as proof. Uh, anyway, uh, oh, I said, OK, it made sense now, but I still refused. Why? Because I told him everything you just said is about you. You want the world to know that you did a good job, that you were smart. But strange as it may seem, memoir isn't about you not even the story of your life, it's a story carved from your life, a particular series of events chosen because they have the greatest resonance for the widest range of people. And at this point in the story, those people don't need to know anything more than that your captors said a cruel thing about your mum. Harry looked down a long time. Was he thinking, seething? Should I have been more diplomatic? Should I have just given in? I imagine I've been thrown off the book soon after uh, this incident. I could almost hear the awkward phone call with Harry's agent, and I was sad, never mind the financial hit. I was focused on the emotional shock. All the time, the effort, the intangibles I'd invested in Harry's memoir uh, would be gone just like that. After what seemed like an hour, Harry looked up, uh, and we locked eyes. OK, he said. Uh, yes, I get it. Thank you, Harry, I said, relieved. He shot me a mischievous grin. I really enjoy getting you worked up like that. I burst into laughter, shook my head, and we moved on to the next set of edits. So I think this proves that Harry was very heavily involved in what actually went into spare. So even though it was ghostwritten, he did have a high level of involvement. I and mean, obviously it all came from him. Another interesting thing, going back to the time when Harry and Meghan were working royals, there was all of this thing about 2 a.m., emails at 2 a.m., working at 2 a.m., blah, blah, blah. We've actually seen an example of this. Um, the ghostwriter has clearly said that Harry was up at 2 a.m. working. Now, I, I don't know whether that was because of time differences between where, where they were, but Harry is certainly not opposed to working at 2 a.m. Is this uh, some kind of work ethic that's rubbed off on Harry? We don't know, but it does kind of prove that he's not above working at 2 a.m. So I just thought that was quite an interesting uh, thing to be talking about. Please let me know your thoughts and comments in the comment section below. Before I go, I should also explain about the jewellery today. So we are wearing Granny's Chips, some of the Cullinan diamonds. Uh, we are wearing the Aquamarine ring, which I really do love. And I paired it, I did wear this yesterday, but I paired it with the Brazilian aquamarine tiara. And this is a really good replica. I'll just tilt my head so you can get a really good look. Um, and it, it, it's amazing. It's one of the larger pieces in the late Queen's collection. And I can't wait to see Camilla 
wearing this. Okay, thank you for watching today's video. If you have enjoyed it, then please give it a big old thumbs up. Don't forget to share on social media. And of course, do hit the bell so that you know whenever I upload a new video. So from me, to you all, and goodbye.